Hey, before we get started with the message, I want to call out a couple of people in a good way. Um, that always sounds weird coming from a preacher. Let me. Um, those of you who are normally in Mosaic at this time or are normally in the gym at the earlier time, but you're here today, I just want to thank you for your flexibility, first of all. Um, as Doug said, that it, there, it takes a lot for, for four services every Sunday morning. It takes a lot to make it happen. Not the stuff you see, but the stuff you don't. And we know that our staff have families and people that they love and um, children and all of that. So we just tried to simplify it a little bit. There's four services, two this morning, one tonight, one tomorrow morning. Uh, but the other person I want to call out is Josh Harrington, Pastor Josh, who in humility, I mean, one of the things that, especially early on as a preacher, you want to preach two services for sure, Christmas and Easter. Um, and I believe, I mean, last year, Doug did the preaching here on Christmas. You, did you preach in Mosaic last year for Christmas? No, we didn't have. So Josh, in humility, said, look, if we have to adjust the schedule, I'll step aside and let Trent get his way. Um, but it is, it just, it's a testament to his character, and he's going to be heading off with a church plant. The other thing that's a testament to his character is the quality of people that are, that are going with him. Um, we're going to miss some of these leaders that are going on this new plant with Pastor Josh and Danielle. Um, uh, but I'm also excited to see them go and excited for the team that he's been able to put together. So uh, with that said, uh, I want to tell you where we're headed this morning. This is the fourth Sunday of Advent. I know it feels to most like Christmas, and we know that many are treating this as their Christmas service, so we will allude to uh, the birth of Christ. It's a little weird for me as a pastor because we're talking about today, um, we're talking about eight days after the, after the birth of Christ, and tonight we'll be talking about the birth of Christ. So chronolo chronologically, it's a little weird, um, but we're gonna, I'm going I'm to pray, I'm going to tell you a story, I'm going to read you a passage, we'll talk about that passage. And then I'm going to read another passage that has to do with this one, uh, but you won't see that one on the screen. I just want you to hear it. It's one of the parables of Jesus. Uh, and then we'll finish up. Uh, we'll, we'll worship in sermon, in prayer, and then in song, and then you'll get uh, a, little, a little treat right at the end, just before the benediction. So let's pray together. Lord, it is your word that we are here to hear. So stand in my shoes, give me your thoughts, give me your, give me your words, so that we hear your message for us, not my message for them. And we pray that you show us only what you want us to see, that you give us only what you want us to have, and that you tell us only what you want us to hear. We pray this in the name of Jesus, through the power of your spirit, for the glory of God our Father. Amen. So have you ever heard of the Taj Mahal? I think it's considered one of the man-made great wonders of the world. They don't know for sure, and I, don't, I haven't done a whole lot of research on it. And there's, a, there's about a dozen legends as to the reason the Taj Mahal was built. So I don't know. I wasn't there. But there is one legend that is very disturbing, and I want to share that one with you today. We know who built it. We know about when it was built, and we know where it is. Um, but the favorite wife... If you have many wives, do not have a favorite. <laughs> not smart. But the favorite wife of the Mughal emperor Shah Jahan died. And he was devastated, and he set out to honor her with this temple that would act as her tomb. He had her coffin placed in the middle of a large par parcel of land and began construction of the Taj Mahal around it. No expense would be spared to make this tomb magnificent. As time went by, the construction of the Taj Mahal became Shah Jahan's obsession. The passion for the building had replaced his mourning and grief of losing his favorite wife. He was consumed. One day, while walking from one side of the construction to the other, his knee hit a big wooden box in the middle of the floor. And as all men, I don't know what language he spoke exactly, but if you hit your shin or knee when you're walking across something, you're going to have some words. He got so frustrated by the fact that he had just bruised his knee that he ordered that the box be thrown out. The contents of the box were the remains of his wife. Now, again, I don't know for sure if the story's true, but the reason for the construction was thrown out and the building was completed anyway. 
Now, there's a point to this. Sometimes the form replaces the function. Sometimes religion takes the place of faith. Sometimes the practice gets rid of the purpose. And that's about all the alliteration I have for you this morning. Now, I know that we would never do something like this, right? We, we would never be people who would take the things that God has given, the great gift of the, of, of the Lord's Christ, this child born in a manger who grew up to be the Savior and Lord of mankind. I know that we would never take the things that he says to us, the things that he taught us, the things he calls us to, we would never take those things and go, nah, I want this instead. Everyone's better than that except me. Because I know that much of the time I want God to give me what I want instead of him and his requirement of me is for me to give him what he died for. And that's all that I am. And we see this spoken before Jesus' ministry ever began. He was eight days old when um, Mary and Joseph, the baby was born in Bethlehem, okay? They were probably hoping, they knew the time was coming, but this This king who thought he was a god ordered a census, and so David had to take from Nazareth to Beth, or Joseph had to take from Nazareth to Bethlehem, the town of David, for this census. And then the baby was born, and eight days later, he's got to make it up to Jerusalem to have this baby circumcised. And it reads like this On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name that the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male must be consecrated, which means set aside for the service of, consecrated to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. A couple little Bible nerdy things for you here. Um, one, usually the father did not have to go through these purification rituals um, after the birth of one of his children because it is not the father that w- in that day that was usually involved in all the fluids that are involved in a birth. But because Mary and Joseph had left Nazareth to go to Bethlehem um, and there wasn't room for them, they were in a, a cave or a stable and the baby was born, Joseph... There weren't mid, they, didn't have, they didn't set up a midwife or anything like that. I'm sure that there were other people around. But Joseph was intimately involved in the delivery of his child. And because he had come in contact with fluids that were bodily, he had to go through this purification ritual as well. So soon after the baby's born in Bethlehem, they go through this process of ritually cleansing themselves. And then they head off to Jerusalem so that Jesus, their son, can be consecrated for the service of the Lord and circumcised. The other thing here is they offer up they offered up what was required of them either two pigeons or two doves. Now these are kind of pauper um, offerings, uh, people that didn't have much money. Although some of the middle class people did offer these. Again, this is just Bible nerdy stuff. Just look if you know all the things I cut out of this, you'll be impressed. Um, so it is, there is some evidence that Joseph was a pretty well off guy. We don't know that for sure, but um, his, he was called a carpenter. That's how we've translated it. But the Greek word there is tekton. It's the word we get for technology. So he could be a simple carpenter. He could be a stonemason who builds great cathedrals and synagogues and homes. He could be someone who, who carves ivory into beautiful furniture. So if you think of a high-end cabinet maker, a high-end finished carpenter today, or someone who does really, really beautiful stonework or towel work, they make a pretty good living at it. So it's possible that Joseph actually had money and that they could have offered up something a little bit beyond pigeons or doves. But if you think about his plan, he didn't have time to go from Nazareth to Bethlehem to have the baby born, go through the purification rituals, and then he had got just a couple of days to get up to Jerusalem, which is a couple of days to get to Jerusalem. He didn't have time to go home and prepare properly for the sacrifices that he would probably like to make. We don't know that he was well off. We don't know that he wasn't. We know that Mary likely was not someone of great means. Okay, end of the Bible nerdy stuff. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. 
He was waiting for the consolation, for the comfort of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit. Now, this is before Mary and Joseph make it into the temple. Moved by the Spirit, he went, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, I'm just going to pause there for a second. Who's had a first child? Okay, eight days later, you show up to church. It might be 10. You show up to church. Some old guy you don't know walks up, scoops that baby up, and starts talking to you. It's a little weird. If you're this 12 or 13-year-old girl who's never kissed a boy, who has a visit from an angel, and your husband has never consummated his marriage with you, but he's here, and you walk into the temple to do everything that the Lord requires of you, and some guy takes your baby away, it's a little weird. And then he starts to prophesy or to speak to the Lord about what promise the Lord had made to Simeon. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now are you now dismiss your servant in peace. For the for the eyes have seen, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what he said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined, destined to cause the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will praise and pierce your own soul too. Now, I don't know about you, not, not many of us are what we would consider charismatic. Most of us are Dutch reformed people. So if you're in a prayer meeting and someone goes, I have a word from the Lord for you, or allow me to place my hands on you and prophesy over you, we know well enough to not say, no, I don't want what God has to offer, but it's going to be a little weird. Someone puts their hand on you and they say, the Lord, but what you're kind of expecting, you can go get that, you can go get that ball. <laughs> it's okay, go get it. Someone kick it to her. There you go. All right. I've had a, this happen to me a couple of times. Lynn's brother actually had a word from the Lord for me back when we were engaged. And at the, at that, it's about 10 years later before I had any idea what it meant. But it wasn't, by the way, your life's going to be hard. These terrible things are going to happen. You're going to face betrayal after betrayal. That is not what you want if the Lord has a word for you. But that's what he gave to Mary. He, he said great things about God, and he said that this will be a, a light to the Gentiles, and it will be the glory of Israel. And then he turned, he blessed the couple, and said some things to Mary. And one of the things he said is that he will cause many to rise and fall. He will, he will reveal the hearts of many people. And, the, and you, like a sword, a metaphorical sword, your soul will be pierced, because she's going to watch her son, whom she loves, suffer and die in her own, while she's watching it. So he's telling her things that she probably does not want to hear. And then another prophet or prophetess comes up and says this. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel uh, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worship night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. So the culmination of everything that the Israelites had been waiting for, everything that God had promised throughout all of history, it's all coming in to view. But some of the words given aren't the words we want to hear. So you're all here it's Christmas Eve, and you're kind of waiting for the preacher to get around. Make me feel good, dude. Make me feel good. Make it all good and happy, 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 joy, joy, uh, unicorns and rainbows and all of that. But that's not the person Jesus was. We were told right here that he's going to call many to rise and many to fall. 
that because of who he is and what's done to him, his own mother's heart is going to be pierced. So let's think about that for a moment. I'm going to give you another passage that shows you the very kind of thing that the ministry of Jesus was about. We were told from the beginning of his life that this is what was going to be. We can actually look back in the scriptures and see all the promises made about him, that he was going to be a suffering servant, that he was going to be a man who called things out, that he was going to be someone who separated bone from marrow, that he was going to separate father from son and mother from daughter, and even sometimes husband from wife. Why did he come? because we're doomed if he didn't. The God of the universe took on flesh, showed his power through powerlessness, showed his humility through being born even of a woman, walking, being taught. The one who spoke things into existence did not have a vocabulary at this point. He couldn't see beyond the length of his own arm. This is a humble God who became not only a man, but a baby, an infant. But as he's going to go through a minor medical procedure on the eighth day of his life, which dads, if that's ever going to happen to your son, don't watch. One of the great traumas of my life. (laughs) But when he's brought and dedicated to the Lord, someone that the Lord had prepared had some things to say. He's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. He's going to separate bone from marrow. He's going to separate those who follow Jesus and those who don't. And I'm going to give you an example of something Jesus said that's kind of pokey. I don't like it. But it fulfills what Simeon said Jesus' ministry would be. This is in the Gospel according to Matthew. won't be on your screen. Just a parable. Jesus spoke to them again in a parable, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like, like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. That's the judges, some of the good kings, some of the prophets. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened and ca- fat and cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. They paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants. He's speaking to the prophets here. Mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Ouch. Because they wouldn't come up to a wedding? But if you think about it, Assyria was sent by God to come through the northern kingdom and destroy what was then known as Israel. And then after that, after they had taken them away, some had taken refuge near Jerusalem, he, he came down, the, the king of Assyria came down, and, and Assyria is Nineveh, it's the, so, um, and he took every fortified city in Judah except for Jerusalem. That's a fulfillment. Or that's Jesus telling them why those things happened. They weren't ready. They weren't listening. They weren't paying attention. They weren't coming to Christ or coming to God on God's terms. They were asking God to come on theirs. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners, invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came, When the king came in to see his guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, how'd you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him up, hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus ends this parable with these words, for many are invited, but few are chosen. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people on whom God's favor rests. The gospel, the person of Jesus, the savior of humanity is available and offered to every one of us. And some of us will rise and some of us will fall. It seems kind of weird that some guy that didn't change his clothes before a banquet gets tied up hand and foot, thrown out where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But I want to tell you why. Because he came to the king's residence on his own terms. 
if you're invited to a banquet, a state banquet at the White House, and they say it's black tie, do you show up in cargo shorts and one of these t-shirts? Or if you watch 50 First Dates, the, the mesh one that only comes to here? Is that how you show up? Or do you come, you borrow money if you have to, and you rent a tux, and you show up and you look the part? I'm not saying that we're supposed to pretend for the sake of Christ, but we do not, as Christians, get to come to Jesus on our terms. We have to come to him on his. He's already left heaven and come to earth. He's already gone from being the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent one and, and, and actually is now subject to time, is subject to being one place. So he's subject to time and space when he's never been before. And the one who knew everything, at least as an infant, knew nothing. Has he not come far enough? Has he not come to us and said to us, come to me, all you who were weary and heavily laden, I will give you rest. Take my burden upon you. It's gentle and easy. But we kind of go, yeah, I think he came to give me what I want. We get tied up hand and foot and thrown out into the street in the darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know the story. We just talked about this a few months ago, those of you who have been around here for a while. Um, the story of what's known as the rich young ruler or the rich young man. And he, 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 this guy is put together, man. He's got his stuff. Everybody kind of clears the way when he walks in because he comes from that kind of family. And he walks, walks up to Jesus. And yeah, he went down to his knees. But he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, he calls him out. He's like, why do you call me good? No one's good but God alone. He says, you know the commandments. Obey your parents. Don't defraud. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. And the guy's checking them off his list. Kept all those since I was a kid. And then the scripture in the gospel of Mark says this. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And said, one thing you lack. <coughs> Sell everything you have. Give to the poor. Follow me. He looked at him and loved him. But because he loved him, he told him what he needed to do. You do not come to me on your terms. You come to me on mine. And the guy walked away, and Jesus let him go. Thanks, pastor, for making us feel so good on Christmas Eve. I'm gonna. If you are someone who knows Jesus, if you are someone who he came to save, and you know he came to save you because you've received for yourself the gift of salvation that he's offered you, then you today can thank God that he came for you. You today can thank God that he, you said to him, your will, not mine. That you, that, you, that you acknowledge that he came to give his life for me and what he asked in return is for me to give my life to him. But if you're a person who goes, you know what, I got this. I got it. Yeah, 2,000 years ago, that's how they had to do it. But I know God. I know, what he, I know what he's about. I don't know what this says, but I know what he's about. Therefore, I'm good. I'm going to do it my way. Then as someone who loves you, I've been here 11 years next week. As someone who loves you, I say these words to you, if that is your attitude, woe to you. Be very, very careful. I'm standing up here today talking about what Simeon said because he said many will rise and many will fall. And I want you to know how to rise by falling. You die to self. You go to your knees. Lord, your way, not mine. Your will, not mine. All of my life is yours. And he says, let's go. But if we come to the Lord with an attitude and we go, give me what I want. He didn't change your clothes. The scripture says when someone is in Christ, he's a whole new creation. The old, gone. The new has come. Let us be the new. Let the old go. Let the old 51st States mess under shoulder pad jersey and the cargo shorts, let him go. Let Jesus clothe you in righteousness and peace 
and hope and joy and let him produce in you the fruit of the Spirit so that other people can see who God is by how you are. If you're someone who knows Jesus personally and have received him as as Lord and Savior, praise God today. And if you're someone who has not, then let today be the day. Every day is the right day to say, yes, my Lord, let your will be done over mine. I pray to God today, and I will in my prayer in just a moment, that you will be those who Jesus caused to rise by falling before him and saying, I am not my own, but I now belong body and soul and life and the death of my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, you tell us, you yourself tell us, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter my kingdom. And then we say back things like, but I prophesied in your name, I preached in your name, and you say, yeah, well, when I was in prison, when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was naked, you didn't come visit me, you didn't feed, give me a drink of water, and you didn't clothe me. Lord, if that's true of any of us here, I ask that you convict us In kindness, Lord, and in mercy, show us how to bend our knee, bend our will, to repent, to confess, and to receive the glory of Israel, hope for the Gentiles, redemption of humanity for ourselves. We pray this in the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit of God who lives within us, for the glory of God our Father. Amen. (laughs)